Julie, and thanks all for joining us. Uh, the lights are on in Paris. The negotiations have begun. The two-week marathon meeting of world leaders on climate. Uh, these negotiations in the UN process is obviously a very, very important landmark in the history of global climate policy, um, both for what they accomplish there, um, but also uh, for how their progress there reflects on the progress that we're making uh, both in state and local action in the US and around the world on building a strong climate movement, on advancing climate solutions, and on getting our own jurisdictions here locally moving in the right direction. The progress that they make in Paris will very largely be a reflection of that state and local progress. Bill McKibben likes to say, the negotiations are, are the scoreboard on climate, not so much the game itself. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the negotiations themselves, just the briefest primer, and, um, and then talk a little bit about how state and local action create the context for global progress and progress in Paris, and then turn it over to uh, some of our local leaders who are busy creating that context. Um, the meeting in Paris, and it's Paris is a nice shorthand for the whole thing, but um, the meeting is the Conference of the Parties, or COP as they, as they call it, um, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's a treaty that was uh, signed by the first President Bush in 1991 and is um, the underlying treaty for all of the climate negotiations. The US is a signatory to that treaty. The goal of the treaty is simply to, quote, prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, meaning let's not toast the planet. Uh, the treaty itself does not define that in very quantitative terms, and much of the content of the first 20 conferences of the parties has been about defining uh, uh, what that means, uh, how much emission reduction we have to do to accomplish it, and who's responsible for what. The generally accepted sort of scientific threshold for uh, dangerous climate change is 2.2 degrees warming, um, 2 degrees centigrade warming in the global average temperature. As most of you, I'm sure, know, that's that's only the global average. Uh, the the local variations, the variations at different latitudes, and all of that. Um, the the temperatures we actually experience don't correspond to that number, but that's the the global average. There is an emerging uh, change and, and growing scientific consensus. Most of the world's countries now support a target of 1.5 degrees, feeling that two degrees is, is too dangerous. But, um, and if folks want to talk about the science behind that, we can do that, but I'll move on from that. Under that target, most fossil fuel reserves, proven fossil fuel reserves, let alone the stuff we haven't explored yet, uh, would be unburnable and would have to be left in the ground. Uh, the treaty itself had no legally enforceable mechanism, and uh, again, much of the negotiations is, have been about how we hold each other accountable uh, to these goals. Who is responsible for what in order to achieve those collective goals is obviously a huge part of the negotiations. Um, and those emission commitments are now referred to um, as, in, in this round of negotiations, as INDCs, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. And they're pretty much bottom up from a national perspective. Each country comes to the table with uh, its intended contribution. Um, and then collectively, the negotiations are about uh, how do we hold each other accountable to those, and what do we need to do to bridge the gap between uh, those uh, sort of voluntary commitments and uh, what we collectively need to do. And the graph um, that I hope you all can see called projected global warming uh, from a handy grist explainer about all this stuff, the data is from Climate Action Tractor, Tracker, gives you a sense of sort of the progress that's on the table. Uh, business as usual, emissions scenario, just keep doing what we're doing and expanding. Fossil fuel use would take us uh, well over the red line into about four and a half degrees centigrade of global warming in this temperature. That is unqualified climate crisis beyond what humans can reasonably adapt to. The INDCs that are currently on the table under optimistic projections about how they get implemented uh, would get it down to 2.5 to 
And it's important to, to hold two truths about that number. One is it's very meaningful progress compared to business as usual. The other is it's really not enough. Um, very meaningful progress is not success um, when you're looking at a red line over which we are uh, in the territory of globally catastrophic climate change. And even with uh, implementation of the offers on the table at this point, we are still over that red line and uh, we need to get back on the right side of it. Um, in addition to these emission reduction commitments, the, the talks are animated by, and much of the content is really about economic justice. And the treaty, the underlying treaty recognizes that, you know, countries start off in dramatically different positions with respect to this problem. Broadly speaking, there are the developed countries who have contributed most of the emissions, achieved most of the economic prosperity in the world, caused most of the problem, have most of the resources and the ability to deliver solutions. They obviously have to play a leading role in solutions. There are the big emerging economies that are lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China and India and Brazil. And uh, they are in all in somewhat different circumstances uh, but uh, from each other and then also different circumstances from, from the countries like the US and the European Union that have already achieved high levels of prosperity by and large throughout their economies. And then there are the people who have done virtually nothing uh, to cause the problem, who have um, you know, minimal carbon emissions and who suffer the worst of the impacts and are in the worst position to be able to deal with those impacts. They all have uh, dramatically different negotiating positions as you would expect. And in order to achieve a global deal, it's just really important to recognize that it's not just a matter of you know, doing the math and adding up the carbon emissions and telling everybody to do their share. If we do not have a global deal that uh, includes uh, a really keen eye on fairness and the different circumstances, economic circumstances of these countries, we will have no effective deal. And so a lot of the deal has to be not just about aggregate emission reduction, but who pays for what? How do we help the countries who have no modern energy services for uh, hundreds of millions of people get them without following a fossil fuel path for <coughs> development? Um, how do we uh, help folks who have no economic resources to adapt to inevitable climate impacts? And frankly, who pays for the loss and damages that are already occurring now and the, and the damages that are already in the pipeline, even if we do everything uh, right on the solutions front? Those are important questions that, that the negotiations will be all about. And then finally, as you can see from the chart, we don't get all the way there with the INDCs. How do we make up the gap over time? These negotiations will sort of define a process and a protocol and a timeline um, for uh, getting from you know, what, what will emerge from Paris with to uh, what is scientifically uh, necessarily necessary and morally right to get emissions back below that red line. So that's the big sort of cop primer on the international negotiations. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about how, the importance of local action. You know, we use the term global warming and it's, it's, it's kind of a useless term except in abstract scientific terms. It describes the trend in the global average temperature, but nobody lives or works or gets anything done in the global average temperature. And, when you really think concretely about this problem, about how we experience the impacts, it's all about home. It's about water. It's about forests. It's about uh, ocean acidification. Uh, these are all very much local problems and impacts. When you think about how we cause the problem, it's with our local transportation and energy systems. And most importantly, when you really roll up your sleeves and get serious about solutions, so much of the important action is local. Um, I don't mean to say for a minute we don't need a strong international agreement, we do, and we need a strong national policy. Um, but even once we have them, so much of the actual getting it done of climate solutions is in local hands. Here in, uh, on the West Coast and in the Northwest, we have a long history of state and local leadership. Um, by no means, not, not, not quite yet, um, by no means uh, what we need yet. Um, but uh, uh, in Seattle and Portland, very long history of strong local uh, climate action plans. Uh, Seattle uh, committed to uh, uh, have the first uh, zero greenhouse gas energy system, electric energy system, 
in two thousand. we achieved that goal in two thousand and five and every year since. um portland has been a leader honestly for longer than seattle and their climate action plan is second to none. the west coast states have been building off of local successes uh, there is a new uh, clean economy on the West Coast uh, report out today. Kimberly will send, a, send around a link for it um, that describes the economic clout that the West Coast jurisdictions bring to the clean energy revolution as we really begin to accelerate the transition. Uh, and I can talk more about these state and local plans as we, as we go if people have questions. Most recently, King County and the, and the surrounding cities in King County, adopted a state-of-the-art local climate action plan uh, for our jurisdiction. And you know, people think of Seattle as a natural leader, but a lot of these jurisdictions are uh, very politically diverse and have a lot of. Uh, the King County Council is politically diverse and has really stepped up to the bar with um, cutting-edge local action. Um, and you'll be hearing shortly from Mayor Hales uh, from from Portland, where climate action planning is is uh, old hat and where they've made some new commitments that really define uh, local determination and local commitment to climate solutions. Businesses from the Northwest, clean energy businesses like Unico, who you'll be hearing from uh, shortly, and also some of our, our bigger employees and, uh, and bigger brand uh, companies in the Northwest. Uh, you know, they, they have a mixed record. I'm not, uh, I'm not here to say they're all where they need to be on climate solutions. But most of our big employers, including Boeing and Microsoft and Starbucks and Intel and Nike, uh, are hard at work on solutions and trying to figure out how they position themselves for uh, success in a world that is serious about reducing carbon. Um, a lot of innovation is out, coming out of those companies, and they still have a long way to go. Um, it's you know these uh, uh, leadership steps by by our, our local communities and our state leaders have a huge positive impact here in the Northwest, but I, I really want to emphasize as the Paris talks begin, what an important positive impact they have on international negotiations. When leaders, business leaders, elected leaders, citizens uh, show up uh, from the Northwest at the international negotiations and show the world a solution-oriented, determined, positive face of America, uh, after 20 years of negotiations when I can tell you that has not been the only face that our national government has brought to these efforts just has buoys and creates a sense of confidence and momentum that even when our national government doesn't always uh, rise to the occasion, that Americans are really serious about solutions and that creates the space for progress internationally. Go to the next slide if you would. The um, fossil fuel resistance that many of you have been covering and that you've seen in the Northwest and around the country, sorry, we're having a little trouble with the slide, but um, has also is an important part of the context for global progress and for uh, uh, progress in Paris over the next two weeks. It's very hard to imagine how we get serious about solutions until we get serious about um, uh, stopping investments, new and further investments in fossil fuel expansion. It is simply too late to invest in solutions and invest in the problem simultaneously. We have to actually make a transition. The transition to clean energy will take many decades, but tomorrow, today, we have to stop uh, uh, investing in fossil fuel expansion that exacerbates the problem, both as a matter of common sense and as a matter of climate math. Uh, we don't have another dime or another minute to spare on big new fossil fuel uh, investments like coal export where uh, Northwest leaders, including prominently the Lummi, are standing up and straightening up their backs and saying this is not our future. Um, like the uh, Polar Pioneer and Shell's subsequent retreat from the Arctic, uh, another uh, big recent local chapter in the fossil fuel resistance. Uh, there is no place for Arctic oil development in a world that is in any way serious about staying uh, below that, that red line on, on climate and Shell's retreat from the Arctic is an incredibly positive development that sends a really strong signal to global negotiators that we're both willing to uh, invest in solutions and we're willing to stand up to the problem. And then finally, of course, the, the Keystone Pipeline, which is uh, a marquee battle in the United States for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is it's the first time a, uh, an American president stood up straight and said no to the fossil fuel industry. Um, 
when candidate Obama talked in 2007 about the tyranny of oil, President Obama finally stood up to that tyranny by rejecting the Keystone Pipeline. Again, a huge positive signal that helps create what you're seeing now in Paris, which is a sense that progress is possible after, after decades of um, uh, slow to no progress in international negotiations. There's a real sense in Paris that we can move forward. And that's uh, you know, in, no, in no small part because we've shown some real will and spine and determination in standing up to fossil fuel dependence as usual. Um, negotiated agreements uh, like this climate treaty are obviously very important. Um, but again, ultimately, the folks who do the work are um, in our cities, uh, in our states, this is where um, solutions will become real. And we can, we can do the math, we can commit ourselves uh, as national governments to international action, and that's an important part of the context. But what's driving the state of the art now, what's creating the context for progress in Paris and what will create the conditions for actually implementing whatever comes out of Paris is happening now in our cities and states and in the climate movement. Um, and you're, uh, about to hear from a couple of the folks who were, who were really uh, driving that action. Just as a final word, I guess I want to say, you know, as an American who's gone to these, um, these negotiations in the past, it can be a very humbling experience. Uh, the world is very, very hungry for American leadership. And uh, President Obama is um, uh, turning over a new leaf, I think, in the American presence in this negotiation. Uh, but we still have no national climate policy, and there's, there's no, no legislated national climate policy, and there's no excuse for that. And when you go as an American and you realize how much people from around the world know about the dysfunction in Congress and, about, uh, and, and ask you questions about why hasn't America showed up as you know, the leader that they still expect America to be, it really, it really makes you just kind of reflect on your role as an American in this stuff. And I have to say that the, you know, the folks in Congress who are now trying to undermine international confidence in the integrity and the willingness of President Obama and of Americans to stand up and deliver solutions in these negotiations by calling into question our contributions to the Green Climate Fund or uh, whether we will in fact implement the Clean Power Plan um, as the President has promised, I think that's a huge disservice. Uh, certainly to future generations in the climate, but to all Americans right now. And I have to say, our, my, my proudest moments in those meetings have been the moments when state and local leaders have shown up, um, uh, uh, talked and engaged with their international counterparts, rolled up their sleeves and committed themselves and, and Americans to solutions. And I know a lot of them are, are over there now, a lot of them are going to be going there in the, in the next few weeks. And we're now going to hear, uh, we're very fortunate to be able to hear from a few of them talking about uh, how their own local actions uh, set the stage for success and will be reflected in Paris. The first, we're very proud to have uh, Portland Mayor Charlie Hales with us. As I said, even, even as a Seattleite, I will go ahead and admit that Portland's been leading the action uh, and, 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 and walking the talk on local climate action for longer than any other city. And that leadership was uh, punctuated in a, in a very uh, profound and important way recently by a resolution that uh, the Portland City Council passed with Mayor Hale's leadership uh, to oppose any further fossil fuel infrastructure expansion in that city. And I think it's a really powerful uh, testimony to the, to the fact that um, by embracing solutions, you really set the stage to be able to set, say no to the problem because Portland of all cities knows that uh, we have a better, a better future ahead of us, a, a future that fossil fuels can't deliver. And if we're going to reach it, we not only have to commit ourselves to solutions, but also stand up to the problem. Mayor Hales, thank you so much for your leadership, and thanks for being with us here today. Oh, thank you, KP. And, and uh, it is good to be from the Northwest because I think we tend to try things out here and succeed at them and then help actually inspire and embolden others. And in fact, I want to key off some of your comments and say that I think one of the things I'm excited about being uh, in Paris to participate in and, uh, and one of the reasons why I think cities' participation there and in these conversations is very important is that the, the role of cities is, yes, as you've described it, we are 
we are laboratories of innovation. We try things, we find that they work, and mayors particularly are great about sharing ideas and best practices with each other. You know, we all beat our chest about our sports teams or our economic development a little bit, but it, at, at bottom, we really don't compete. We really try to support each other in building livable communities. And every time I go to a U.S. conference of mayor's meeting or a C40 meeting, the same thing happens. We're sharing ideas. I was talking to Mayor Parks Tao in Johannesburg about a new company in Portland that builds uh, energy generating equipment that fits in water lines and you know a few months later he came to Portland to meet with them and brought his engineers with him. That's the kind of thing that that happens when mayors get together and participate in these discussions. So cities are the laboratories of innovation and the locus of most of the action on climate action. But there's another important piece I think of the city's role that I think needs to be highlighted more and that is Sometimes when you listen to the international climate debate, it sounds like, you know, an allocation of burden. Of how much foregone economic growth are we going to have to put up with? And cities' role uh, really belies that. That cities are demonstrating a positive vision of a future that's based on a high quality of life and sustainability. And the world is beating a path to those cities that are the most walkable and sustainable. And so Portland and other cities like us, we're growing very fast because capital and talent are mobile and those, those dollars and those people want to be in sustainable places. So it's not, a, it's not a, an allocation of downside. It's who wants to get to the future quicker. And that's really a lot of why we've succeeded in Portland. And in fact, my personal story, I was a city commissioner back in the 90s when we adopted that um, climate action plan, started putting some of those things into effect. Then I left the city, went into the private sector, and helped other cities around the country build their first rail transit projects. And it was the same thing there. They weren't saying, oh, traffic's terrible, we're going to have to force people out of their cars. No, they were trying to run towards an economic future where transit supports a very high value pattern of real estate development. And sure enough, it's worked in Seattle, it's working in Portland, it's working in Tucson, it's soon going to work in Kansas City and Cincinnati uh, because, again, capital and talent are flowing towards places that aren't stuck in traffic. Uh, and aren't in buildings that are energy hogs. So I, I really want to emphasize that, that I think the city's role is not just as a, an uh, on-the-ground implementer, but also as a positive vision for the future of urban life, where most economic activity and where most carbon emission is taking place. Uh, a couple of other particulars here, you know, we, we've just moved from a voluntary to a mandatory program for energy ben benchmarking for commercial buildings. And as usual, our Bureau of Planning and Sustainability did a great job of working with private sector companies like Unico and saying, you know, let's, let's go ahead and make the transition, make this official. And it was done uh, without really any controversy. The, the real estate community, the, the building owners in Portland had been brought along in this partnership uh, and had been adding value on their own. And so again, we don't regard this as sort of wearing a hair shirt that, oh gosh, we've got to do the right thing and, and it's going to be painful. So um, I think that recent movement that we've had here, not only on the, on the big resolution about no more fossil fuel development here, but also what we've done on benchmarking shows that we've got a pretty high level of consensus now with the private sector uh, not all of them. There's still people here that are very frustrated and mad that we're not building a, a giant propane terminal here, but um, so be it. That's not the future. Terrific. Thank so you. So I guess uh, happy to happy to uh, want to save some time uh, for the end for for questions and discussions. But I think those are you know those are the key points from here. We're getting things done. You know we've moved the needle in Portland. You know, we've, we've actually reduced our per capita carbon emissions 35% below 1990 levels, all while we've added, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of jobs and people. Uh, we now have about 12,000 green jobs in the city. We had 55 businesses just sign up to a little mayor's business challenge, the business climate challenge that I put together uh, before heading to Paris. So, you know, we keep we keep setting the bar higher and achieving it, again, in part because we've got private sector working with us now. 
Uh, and again, as we get to Brett, I think that's really important yep. that we've got to have that kind of agreement with the, with the business community and support from our national governments in order to get the rest of the way uh, to our goals. Yeah. Mayor Hales, what a great keynote. Thanks so much. It's no, no coincidence that everybody wants to be in Portland. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and speaking of the private sector, um, our next speaker is Brett Phillips, the Director of Sustainability for Unico Properties and co-founder of the 2030 District Network and uh, you know a key, a key implementer for making this vision real in, in cities. Brett. Well, uh, good afternoon, and Casey, thank you so much for uh, the introduction and, and for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about what Unico is doing, and and really uh, maybe a little bit more about what's happening on a on a national and international level with uh, our our growing 2030 district network. Um, just for context, if you're unfamiliar with Unico Properties, uh, we're a commercial real estate company based in Seattle. Uh, we're one of the larger property owners, managers, and developers um, in Seattle and Portland uh, with a very big focus on high-performance green buildings. Uh, you may be familiar with some of our work in Seattle and Portland. Uh, we manage the Bullet Center. Uh, we're an owner for Stone 34 in Fremont in Seattle, which is where Brooks Sports is. And we uh, also uh, own and manage the U.S. Bancorp Tower in Portland, as Mayor uh, Hills may know, is the largest and tallest LEED certified building in the state of Oregon. So uh, we have a, a very big commitment to high performance green building. We're investing in renewable uh, energy, in particular on-site solar at our properties in particular in Denver, Salt Lake, and Austin. Um, so we are very much as a company committed uh, to sustainability in the built environment. That said, we understand that uh, well, we, we have a, a, a nice size portfolio for a privately held commercial real estate company uh, making a, a dent in uh, climate change and global warming uh, within our own portfolio will be small, but we really have to take uh, our actions and, and make them bigger than who we actually are. And that really comes from a recognition that 40% well, of global emissions come from the built environment and that 75% of emissions um, in cities uh, internationally come from our buildings. So cities, sustainable cities, have to be a huge part of the solution, uh, and we think a really, really uh, major part of the solution, and we're trying to, to make that happen. Uh, really with the beginning and the founding of uh, the, originally the Seattle 2030 district here in Seattle with a number of private sector uh, companies and peer organizations in the commercial real estate, uh, company. I'm actually uh, had to exit our board meeting, which is uh, happening right next to me at the Downtown Seattle Association right now, with a room uh, chock full of private sector leaders uh, from Vulcan and Wright Runstad and um, uh, Hines and CB Richard Ellis, folks who are really committed to moving the built environment forward uh, for the betterment uh, of our uh, community here in Seattle, the Northwest, the nation, and the world. Uh, so what we did was we founded the, this. 2030 district in Seattle, which is uh, built on uh, the Architecture 2030 Challenge goals to reduce energy, water, and transportation emissions by 50% at a city scale by the year 2030. And that's significant because if we do so, that will set our cities on a path to climate stabilization and eventually uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, that's the science behind the goals and the math and really the magic behind what we're trying to do. But when we started this four years ago here in Seattle, we did so with the idea that we have to do something that, that doesn't only work for Seattle, but that works for other cities across our country and across the world. It had to be scalable and it had to be re replicable. And that's what's happening. This is a voluntary private sector response to trying to overcome market barriers and, and in many ways public sector barriers uh, to moving our built environment both for new and existing buildings forward. Uh, so now this 2030 uh, uh, network is in 11 cities across North America and I will be speaking, uh, I'm heading to Paris later this week and speaking next week at the Forum for Zero Emissions by 2050 uh, on transforming the urban core private sector solutions to uh, advancing this problem and, and starting to have the discussion about how Metsphere will be taking the 2030 
network to an international stage um, and to international cities beyond North America. So uh, that's uh, a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, we think um, sustainable cities have to be a huge, huge part of the solution. Uh, and private sector, the private sector and businesses uh, who have in many ways benefited from uh, the problem also need to be part of the solution moving forward. Uh, we think it's uh, the best thing for uh, future generations, but also for our bottom line and for businesses. We can do well and do good uh, at the same time. Um, and that's really what's at the nexus of, of this effort. And uh, I'm very excited to be headed to Paris in a few days and uh, taking a message on what we're doing uh, to the international community. So great, Brett. Thank you so much. And our final speaker is our own Elizabeth Wilmot, who runs our new Energy Cities program here at Climate Solutions, has been uh, very involved at the county and city level and, and even in the federal government in uh, supporting and uh, implementing the clean energy revolution in our urban centers and just issued a new report on it. Elizabeth. Great. Thanks so much, Casey. Again, I'm Elizabeth Wilmot. I manage the new Energy Cities program here at Climate Solutions, which has partnered with Northwest Cities since 2009 to make deep cuts in carbon emissions. We research and advise local officials on how to execute on the most cutting edge solutions for carbon reduction. Um, today's paper that Casey mentioned, The Urban Clean Energy Revolution, is a compilation of over 50 of the world's leading examples of urban climate solutions. And in this paper, we found that there has been a huge acceleration of local government, lo local government action toward reducing carbon emissions in the past 10 years. Over the past decade, local officials have become increasingly sophisticated about how to make deep cuts in carbon emissions and are experimenting successfully with new partnerships and policy tools, as Mayor Hales alluded. But a lack of funding is a major and persistent barrier to achieve the deep cuts in carbon emissions that we need. More specifically, we identified six key ingredients of successful urban climate leadership. First, local governments have set increasingly ambitious goals, such as using renewable energy for 100% of community needs and achieving carbon neutrality, meaning zero carbon emissions from electricity, heating, cooling, and transportation. Seattle and Portland, as, we, as we've talked about, are among the world's leaders in this regard. Second, they are developing and executing on specific practical clean energy transition plans to phase out fossil fuel and adopt 100% renewable energy. Examples include local governments as diverse as Greensburg, Texas, excuse me, Greensburg, Kansas, Georgetown, Texas, San Francisco, California, and Sydney, Australia. Third, local officials are using existing policy tools as well as experimenting with new approaches. Tokyo, Japan, and Shenzhen, China pioneered city scale systems to cap and price carbon emissions, while Lancaster, California is requiring that all new rooftops come equipped with solar panels or have access to solar energy. But urban leaders are not traveling this road alone. They are partnering with local jurisdictions and international networks ranging from the local geographic cluster of the King County City's climate collaboration to the International Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance to get deeper and faster results. A number of cities are also making the case for bolder climate action by aligning with other important community priorities. Buffalo, New York overcame serious economic decline after state and local officials doubled down on clean energy economic development incentives. Beijing, China, and Salt Lake City, Utah focused on reducing air pollution while also cutting carbon emissions. And closer to home, Portland in incorporated sustainable <coughs> justice systematically into its climate plan. But as I mentioned previously, unlocking the funding to pay for bold climate action remains a persistent barrier. A small minority of the cities in the world have sufficient funding to achieve bold clean energy agendas, primarily those communities with a price on carbon emissions, support from other, local, of other levels of government, or those that have had the courage to tax or bond explicitly for climate action. Without a significant jump in financial support, local governments are hard pressed to bring clean energy to a large scale. And so while other urban leaders are not waiting for other levels of government to take action, they do need an order of magnitude jump in funding and collaboration to scale up this work. This funding could come directly from local governments who choose to use their taxing and bonding authority, public-private partnerships, or other levels of government. So this report that we're releasing today is rich with examples. Um, I believe Kimberly will be sending it out after the call, and I'm happy to happy to take any further questions. There's just a ton going on. Yeah, and we're going to now move to questions. This is Kimberly Larson with Climate Solutions. I'm going to send out a few links after the fact, including this report. And I do want to stress and emphasize it's really this report that Elizabeth put together is very rich 
with excellent stories from around the globe as far as cities, um, and it's just, it's just been very well done. Um, I do want to note the mayor um, either is going to soon have to leave, so we're going to move to questions and answers. But we want to direct any questions if he's still able to be on the phone to the uh, mayor Hales first, because uh, he has to get to another meeting at two o'clock and had to leave at 1:45. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions first for the mayor um, that people want to either unmute or chat in, and then we can go from there. And mayor, you're still with us. I am. I am, and Great. I can probably cheat on that schedule a little bit. Okay. But, uh, thank Great. you for appreciated being mindful of my schedule. Absolutely. So now we want to just open it up and welcome any questions. People can unmute their phones and just introduce who you are. Very shy group. Very shy. I know. If any of the press on the phone have any questions, I know we had a good number of reporters, so I want to encourage you all to ask your questions. You scared them away. Or covered it all. You didn't scare them away. Folks are still there. People have any questions? <clears throat> sure, this is James Daly. I'll, I guess I'll venture a question here. Um, do you think that uh, the headlines at the end of this uh, current round of talks are really going to be around the steps that uh, local governments and um, the U.S. has made, or do you think that other aspects of the negotiations will be sort of, you know, more important um, in terms of you know generating headlines? Do you? Anticipate um, private sector, uh, you know, sort of dominating those headlines, or, or government at the local level, or, or a national story. Do you want to direct well, my that experience? Yeah. This is Charlie Hales again. My experience is that the 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 headlines will be about the the conflicts between the nations as they negotiate. That's how it started out, at least. Um, and and again, uh, hopefully the the strategies, whether they get the attention in the press or not, the strategies will rely more, you know, on this kind of INDC approach of what what commitments are we willing to make here in our country and in our cities, and how do we actually accomplish those? And that's what we bring to the uh, to the to the. Uh, to the event here. There's an old children's book called Stone Soup, you know, where they need to make soup and somebody brings a pot and a rock and then says, well, what do you have? And somebody brings some carrots and somebody else brings some onions and so on. Um, that's, to me, uh, a more constructive approach, not just because it's voluntary. I think we have to hold ourselves accountable here. I'm not saying this is all just easy stuff, but the more that these strategies are partnerships in which the federal government in some country says, okay, we will actually make a long-term increased commitment to high-speed rail and urban transit if you cities will commit to stopping sprawl and investing in a workforce for the green economy. And the private sector says, well, we can help there by you know, investing uh, in, in concert with those goals. You know, that those kind of shared commitments uh, which are going to be different from place to place, at, are where we've made progress already. And I expect it's where we'll make more actual progress in the future. Um, the, so the, the international commitments matter, but they matter most when they go back home and act on them in concert with, city, with cities and the private sector. This is this is KC. I'll add to that a little bit. Um, you know, James, you've seen follow these international processes. The headlines and the media tend to you know gravitate towards sort of the the marquee commitments and and uh, the national squabbles, as Mayor as Mayor Hale said. Um, I think you know one of the important lessons coming out of previous negotiations is um, 
you know, not waiting for anybody to ride in on a white horse or, and, you know, not waiting for the talks to fail. Um, I think when, when all is said and done, what we'll have out of the talks is a measure, <clears throat> a measure of how far we've come and a measure of how far we have yet to go. Um, and national leaders and slow moving international institutions are going to measure that for us, but they're not going to decide it. They're not going to implement it. They're not going to um, do the critical things that need to be done to, uh, you know, move us from where we are to, to where we need to be. And so, you know, my hope is that we can keep a, a stronger focus on uh, not, not what they did or didn't accomplish, but how, what it tells us uh, about, about the success to date of local action and the growth of the climate movement and the, and the acceleration of solutions and, and what kind of signals it gives us about, uh, you know, the work still to be done and how far we have yet to go. Um, but uh, if there's any lesson from 20 years of negotiations is these, these events are high profile, but, but uh, the real action is, you know, the work we're doing here and now. Are there other uh, questions from the uh, reporters on the phone before we um, are able to wrap the call? What I'm gonna, anybody who um, hasn't announced themselves, I was able to, I think, keep track of the attendance and really want to appreciate, uh, you know, express an appreciation for taking the time um, at this busy time to um, you know, just be covering this and thinking about this. And it's um, so I want to just say that because I know uh, you all are very busy. Um, want to also then just ask if there's somebody you don't think I got your name, please zip me a quick email so because I'm going to be sending out some follow-up links and materials. The other thing I want to stress is that this is, you know, we have a two-week uh, run at this here. Uh, so as you're putting stories together, and this is one of the things we wanted to stress, there's a lot of ways to more broadly define this term that's tossed around in the midst of the climate uh, negotiations of subnational action. And looking at the private sector, all the ways that the Northwest has really been in the bullseye of the fossil fuel industry and is stopping the infrastructure of further fossil fuel investments um, at scale is significant. And then also all of these you know, stories from the cities, both here in the Northwest, as the mayor's emphasized, um, the private sector stuff that Brett has walked through, and a lot of the rich stories that uh, Elizabeth emphasizes in her report are really just great story fodder. And so I'll be sending out those links after this as additional follow-up, but also want to request that you all should um, keep me posted if there's additional interviews you want to do. There's other folks not on this call from the Northwest who are also either over there now or who will be over there, and we can definitely connect you, or at least to try to, um, in the midst of the busyness over there to get some further interviews um, and angles um, as you uh, look at this. Um, want to just well, ask- thanks for including me. I'm in ring off this yeah. Charlie Hills again, and I'll, some of you in Paris. Thank you so much, Mayor, for your time. We greatly appreciate you uh, participating in this and your leadership. Thank you. Take care. Um, any other questions from uh, the crowd? Otherwise, we will uh, wrap up. All right. Thank you so much.